All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And please, as a reminder, try to keep yourself muted so we don't have background noise. Um, and then we'll open it up for questions and discussion here in just a little bit. Thank you so much for joining us this morning, this midday, depending on where you're at. I'm Margot Hale with the National Center for Appropriate Technology. And um, many of you may be familiar with our ATRA program, Sustainable Agriculture Information Service, and our training for military veterans called Arm to Farm. I do see a few familiar names and faces on on the call. So thanks for joining us and many others that I don't know. So I am very happy to have everyone participating. Um, and I do hope that this is a time where we will try to answer some of your questions. And really we, we wanted to provide a space um, really just to hear what's going on with you. And if, if you have any challenges or questions that our NCAT staff may be able to help answer and, um, and, and really just a space for you guys to share what's going on and stay connected. So I'm going to quickly just do a couple of introductions. And um, Andy, I'll let you kind of introduce yourself real quick since you've, you're helping me put this thing on. Sure, thanks Margo. And hello everyone. It's uh, I'm in New Hampshire. It's a beautiful day outside after quite a bit of rain. Uh, but thanks so much for taking time to, to join us today. As Margo said, we really want to just create a space uh, to hear about some of the challenges you all are facing as well as some of the opportunities. I think the, uh, the conversation between differences in types of markets, whether it's direct, intermediate, or wholesale, are, are quite different right now. And so we want to sort of go on that path and see um, what questions you have and also some of the innovative ideas you've come up with uh, in terms of your markets. Um, I know on my farm, uh, we've had to, as a direct market, primarily a CSA, we've had to do very little marketing this year. Uh, we're completely sold out, um, which has really helped our, our marketing budget. However, we're really trying to uh, figure out some of the logistics in terms of pickups and deliveries, uh, as well as how to even get our scales certified right now. Um, so sort of just trying to go through the motions of, of getting things in place uh, during this time and uh, look forward to talking about all this on today's call. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks, Andy. And um, we invited our friend Rusty Rumley with the National Ag Law Center to join us on this call. Rusty, um, I'll let him introduce himself, but Rusty has helped us out with a lot of trainings over the years and, and providing legal information for farmers. And we know that a lot of the questions we've been hearing have had some legal aspects to them. We know there's programs and rules and regulations and all sorts of things um, that need some clarification and answers. And so we invited Rusty to, to help maybe answer some of those questions for you all. So Rusty, if you would give yourself a quick introduction. Yeah, I'm uh, Rusty Romley with the National Ag Law Center. I'm a senior staff attorney and I've been here, golly, uh, about 12 years now. Um, we're trying to put together resources for the COVID-19 outbreak. Uh, and right now we've been trying to get as many questions from people as we can to try to see where the interest lies because we're getting questions that are just all over the place right now. So th this is gonna be really helpful for us as well. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. And I, I just will mention that we have several of our NCAT staff members and specialists also on this call. So um, we have lots of folks who are here to help you. And as Rusty mentioned, we want to hear the questions that you have, um, you know, the concerns or the things that you're trying to figure out. And we will do our best to provide some answers and resources here on this call. And um, some of them might take a little bit more digging, a little more research, but we will definitely get back with you um, to help answer your questions. That's that's why we're here. That's why our NCAT staff is here, is to help you, to help our farmers and our farmer veterans um, be able to you know, navigate the situation with the, the COVID situation. And we know things have changed and are rapidly changing. And 
Um, there's lots of uncertainty. So we want you guys to know that, that we're here. We provide resources and help answer your questions. One thing I wanna do to get started, um, you sh everyone should see a little chat bubble um, that's on my screen. It's kind of in the top right hand corner of my screen. Um, is a little chat chat box. And if you could type in your your name and your location of where you're at and your farm name or if you're with an organization, type that in there. Um, so we can all see who is on the call with you know 30 or 40 folks on the call. It's a little hard to 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 go around and I'll speak at once. But I would love to see where folks are calling in from. And so those of you who are on the phone, I, I realized you can't you can't do that. But if you're on the computer, if you could just type in where you're calling from, who you are, that would be great. It's good to see so many folks. I thought it might just be Andy and I on the call. So I'm I'm glad that <laughs> that we've got some folks interested. Hi Mardine. Hey Margo, how are you? Good. Good. Thanks for joining. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I guess to, to start things off, are there any pressing questions from anyone on the phone? You can unmute yourself if you have a question or concern, that if there's something that you are trying to figure out right now and you just need some help um, or you are searching for an innovative idea, that's, that's why we're having this call. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to either type them in the chat box if you want, or if you would, um, you can unmute yourself and ask as well. Margo, this is Devana. Um, I am with NCAT folks. I'm the director of sustainable agriculture and work with this awesome team. We, I've run some other listening sessions across the country and we're hearing a lot of challenges with folks scrambling to change from wholesale it's to um, because now those markets are gone for them right now to uh, direct a consumer or find another avenue. I'm wondering, are you folks on the line here facing these issues? Yeah, has anyone had to switch how they're marketing their products? Anything you want to share? And here at our farm, we were just getting ready to start looking into wholesaling. Um, we were contacted by an area person that was going to push our product into Kentucky and Ohio restaurants. However, when this pandemic hit, we literally have almost sold out of every single piece of meat that we have. And now we have the problem that there's no processors out there to get our beef and our pork into. So now we're not going to have, we've got a little bit coming back, um, but we don't have any way to get anything processed now until August. So that's been like our biggest hurdle right now. Martin, is you don't have the processor because they're already booked or because I know you, you obviously are working with the processor because you sell meat, but they're just yeah. booked. Um, right before the pandemic hit, they were booking from three weeks to six weeks in advance. Um, and when this all hit, they started booking out to August. So everybody had seen the writing on the walls and he said he's worried that he's not going to have the people show up for his mm -hmm. appointment, but he is booked out that far in advance. And um, here in our area, we just don't have a lot of processes that are state approved or um, USDA approved to go to. Yeah, well, that's a problem everywhere. <laughs> Unfortunately, not just in your area, um, but that, you know, I, I definitely have heard, especially meat producers, because um, grocery stores have been sold out of so much meat that local meat producers have seen a huge demand in in their products. So basically, you guys are sold out of everything that you have right now, is what you're saying? Well, we're, of course, I've got liver and heart and bones um, <laughs> and, and, you know, some other pork products. But, you know, the pork products that people want, those are all gone. And, you know, the easy stuff of beef to cook, that's all gone from you. Yeah. Oh, I wish I had an answer to the lack of access to processing. That would make all our uh, local livestock producers really happy. Um, but that's, that's definitely something to consider. And 
Um, thanks for sharing that challenge with us, Martine. Thanks, Martine. Can I ask, are they running wait lists? No. Um, all the places around here that I have called, they don't do any wait lists. So it's just a matter of, and I think that they're going to probably have to change the way that they operate based on the fact that everyone I've talked to said, well, we've got everything booked, but we're afraid that to be finding it elsewhere to get it processed, you know, so I'm sort of on the fence of every week to two weeks I'm calling and bugging them, which I feel really bad, but it's the way of life that I've got to start doing. Absolutely. Margo and I understand and so many others on the phone understand so well as you're, if you're doing pigs or whatever you're doing and you're feeding them every day, every day that you're feeding them, you're going to shrinking your margins and then you're going to end up losing money. So if I'd call every week, I think I, <laughs> times were getting tight, I'd be calling every morning, hi, it's me, remember me, yeah. can I bring my pigs in yet or whatever it is. And yeah. See if okay. there's any cancellations. I'm also wondering about grain. I've been hearing murmurings of grain problems and I'm hoping that that's, I, we do pigs here and we're about to pick up our shoats and I'm, you know, nervous, nervous about not having grain if I need it. And we do non-GMO or organic grain. So that would be a problem. Any other callers on the line? Have any of you had problems sourcing feed at this time or are hearing of lack of access to feeds? Martin? In our area, the feed prices went up considerably. Um, I had my son go and run one morning when I was at market and um, the feed prices had doubled what I was not used to. Oh my gosh, that's okay. shocking. For what? Uh, are you feeding a non-GMO grain or is that conventional grain? No, this was conventional grain that he went to pick up that morning, um, but the non-GMO company that I just recently found, they're only about 25% higher. So we're getting ready to switch over to that. Um, okay, I'm seeing some, some questions come up in the chat box. So I'm gonna look through these real Fast. Mimi is sharing that a lot of the, our farmers are adding an online component to allow for non-contact pickups at farm. And absolutely, I'm seeing that all over the country, um, both farmers markets and just farmers who are taking orders online and then doing delivery or pickup. That has been a, a great thing. Um, obviously, those farms who already had an online platform or farmers market um, online platform are at an advantage. You know, it, it can definitely take some work to get some of those online platforms set up. So anyone, anyone else on the line want to share what they've, what they've done to maybe switch to an online platform for orders and or delivery? Andy, have you guys set up any online thing or are you just so local? It's all just kind of normal well, um, it is mostly local. However, um, even just in our own neighborhood, folks um, aren't comfortable um, handling money. So we have had to set up various online payment forms, uh, which mm -hmm. is very easy to do. Um, but that's something we've had to do very quickly as well. What platforms are you using to take? Venmo, PayPal, what are you using? Uh, PayPal, Venmo, um, those are the two that come to mind. I think there may be one more we're looking into. Okay, um, Rusty, this might this is probably a question for you. <laughs> uh, Mimi, Mimi, who's in Pennsylvania, asks, any explanation why the SBA EIDL loans are not available to farms other than aquaculture enterprises, ag co-ops, or nurseries? Yeah, so there is actually language that was already in the SBA uh, legislation already. Those in, it's pre-existing law. And it basically says that in order to avoid duplication of services, farmers should work directly with FSA for loans. So when they passed the CARES Act, they modified bits and pieces of that law or that section of the law, but they didn't modify that that phrase that you know went back to the saying don't don't loan to farmers because FSA is already handling it. So that was why. <laughs> I read it, that's why I see the issue with the EIDL loans, is they didn't change that one phrase. You'll hear people saying, well, they didn't forbid farmers from getting EIDL loans under the CARES Act, and that's correct. That prohibition was already in there, and they just didn't remove it. 
I mean, they, they, they put that CARES Act package together really quickly. So it's not too surprising that they left some things out. And Rusty, I was um, with you the other day, you, um, there's still a lot of uncertainty about some of the funding that's coming through USDA or potentially coming through USDA for farmers. I don't know if you want to say just a, a couple of things about some of the legislation that has happened and, you know, we hear bits and pieces. Um, so any anything that you can tell us of what will be available for farmers or how it might directly impact farmers? So for most of the farmers, it's going to be, uh, especially for specialty crop and livestock, there was a nine and a half billion dollars put into the CARE Act. The thing is that the, the provision that says that is like a paragraph long. I mean, it basically just tells USDA to set up programs for specialty crop, livestock, dairy is included in that nine and a half billion. They've been really hurt in the last, man, five or six years easy. So, I mean, they're gonna be getting a chunk of it, but it doesn't, there's no parameters on how to set it up. I mean, they've pretty much just given USDA carte blanche authority to do, to, to do whatever they want with it. So we're still waiting to hear how USDA is gonna set up that program. I know with like the MFP program, I, there's there's mechanisms in place to get money to row crop farmers. I mean, they're familiar faces at the FSA office. Uh, some of your specialty crop growers, it, it doesn't work the same way. I mean, there just hasn't been the same level of program support for specialty crop growers like there has been for row crop. So it, it's gonna be tricky to, to create something would be my guess. Will you just, <laughs> note and I know Andy you had a couple of resources we can maybe post up there as well about the PPP program and that farmers are um, eligible if they have employees. Rusty I don't know if you want to say a few things about that. Yeah, if Andy wants to start we've got resources on it too. Sure um, I just posted a guide um, that came out from Growing Farmers uh, Michael Kilpatrick's group that uh, is an overview of the CARES Act for farmers. Um, but I'll also, um, in a moment, post a few other resources. One is, as Rusty mentioned, um, also within PPP, the, the Paycheck Protection Program, um, the SBA wants folks to go to the FSA programs first. And so the, I will post a directory of what these FSA programs are for you all to evaluate. Um, and then there's also, um, a directory of SBA approved lenders. Um, so that's where you have to go for these programs. So I can put up a directory as well, um, as a, a, along with the initial pre-application, which is the information you need to access these programs. So it helps put everything in order, things you'll need to know, the information you need to gather to access these. Um, but there's, there's, you know, as, and Rusty can really talk more to the, the components of the program, particularly PPP. Um, but it's really to help retain and rehire workers. Um, and they're really targeted to small businesses under 500 employees. So they wanna see that you're actually keeping your, your employee numbers level, if not increasing or rehiring quickly. And that can um, go into how they forgive the loan or if they give you a deferment uh, for up to six months. Um, so it's really based on you know keeping your employees, uh, keeping the, the wages, the same um, to really access this program to help you with other uh, mortgage interest, rent, utilities, things like that. One thing I would add to that is I don't know how many of you guys use H-2A labor, but they've actually got a specific provision in there that says employees are employees that principally reside within the United States. So if you are using any H-2A labor, they would not count for purposes of your payroll. So watch out for that. I know most people on this call are probably gonna be smaller farmers that don't use uh, H-2A labor, but if you are or you're thinking about doing it, be careful and watch for that. Thanks. Okay, we had a, a question um, from John and he is transitioning from the military and is in the farm planning search process. So good luck with that, John. Um, has the farm lending process for beginning farmers become more difficult during this time? 
Um, I do know that FSA offices are operating basically by appointment only. You know, their offices aren't just open for you to stop in. So if you are, um, and banks are operating the same way. So if you are, you know, trying to work through an FSA loan, um, you would just have, it would just be a little more difficult in that you would need to, you know, call for an appointment. I have not heard of any delays in, you know, processing applications. I do know they has extended some of their deadlines and sign up periods just to give folks a little more time on some of their existing programs. Um, you know, Andy or any NCAT staff on the line, if you have heard anything about, um, you know, lending processes being slowed down during this time, please jump in. I don't know if anyone on the line has wants to share if they've had any experience working with their FSA or any other USDA agency office during this time and, and how that has changed. Please, please share. Well, I can say, uh, this is Andy, I did receive notification from um, my, my FSA uh, lender, my county agent, and um, basically saying the offices are closed. Uh, they're open by appointment only, um, so we've been talking on the phone. Um, they did mention that if I needed to hold off on some payments, that that's something we can discuss, but um, I was able to make my payment for a microloan this month, and I can tell you that uh, they cashed it very quickly. <laughs> they haven't delayed they haven't delayed their processing of payments <laughs> okay this is a question from carolyn carolyn um she's raising wildflowers and i believe for seed if i'm remembering correctly when we talked to carolyn um are, are those considered a specialty crop is that andy yes that's correct Okay, so yes, Carolyn, that is considered a specialty crop and so important for FSA and other programs that would fall under the specialty crop category. Please <coughs> to send in more questions or just speak up if there's something you want to share or if you have any um, good resources, there's been a few resources shared in the chat box. Um, Devana shared Lulu's Local, which is an online platform that um, she knows farmers are using. And as we mentioned, Andy did post some links to the CARES Act and FSA programs, loan programs, SBA approved lenders. So those are in the chat box. Um, Hey, thank you. Kara um, posted Barn to Door, which is another online platform for taking orders and, um, you know, doing online orders of product. So thanks, Kara, for posting that one. Yes, R Rusty shared the National Ag <laughs> Center um, COVID webpage, and I have a slide that has our Atra COVID resources and um, National Ag Law Center, I'll go ahead and put that up there real fast so everyone can see. Devana, is Lulu Locals only in Virginia? A question came in, or is that a national platform? Do you it know? may be, it may be, I don't know. This came up on our Virginia listening session, so I, this is part of an email that she sent me, and she says that we are charging $10 a quarter, every three months or 2% of sales, whichever is larger, applies to all markets generating less than 100K in annual sales. And then there's her contact information and it is Virginia Foundation for Agriculture Innovation. I'll email and ask her. Okay, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. So everybody um, can have it. Um, there are Andy and I's email addresses. Um, in our Atra webpage, and then there's Rusty's email address and, and webpage as well on there, and then links to our Arm to Farm page and Facebook group. Um, several on the call, or a few of you anyways, have been through our Arm to Farm training, and on our Facebook page, we post lots of resources available for farmer veterans, and then links to both the Atra and the National Ag Law Center's COVID resources. So. 
I'll let Rusty um, talk a little bit about the National Ag Law Center's COVID resources in that page. And um, the, ATRO, the ATRO COVID page um, has different um, sections, including a section for financial assistance. So it has links to resources and there are some small grant and um, kind of emergency financial assistance programs available. Those are listed there. Um, we have videos of from some of our NCAT specialists and how they are dealing with the, the COVID situation and different innovative ideas from our farms and things in our area. So um, you can see those videos and then just a lot of other resources. Um, Rusty, you wanna say just a bit about the resources that are on the National Ag Law Center's page? So what we've been doing is a, uh like a FAQ page. So we've actually got a lot of the stuff in there. So uh, links on how you can apply for the PPP. Uh, there's some really good resources out there on that. Uh, some of the tax implications of it, uh, what things you need to make sure that you use that money for in order to get forgiven for the loan. Uh, we've got some really good resources out there on the PPP program for people that are uh, looking into that. We've also been getting a lot of questions on the labor side and contracts, like people are breaking contracts or, uh, and, and that's something that we've been trying to get together as well. Uh, that's much more on a ad hoc basis. I mean, but uh, especially for the things like the, uh, the labor issues, we're trying to get a really good database for uh, dealing with uh, ongoing labor issues as it goes into the Margo, just real quick, um, yep. Molly got back to me that quick on email. No, they are nationwide. So okay. you guys see what her fees are. $10 a quarter every three months or 2% of sales, whichever is greater. Okay, thanks, Devana. Mimi shared Square is another option for taking payments. You can set up a a free online store and she gives a link to a webinar that Debbie Ruse in North Carolina did about getting that set up. So um, you can check that link out in the chat if you're interested in figuring out that online payment um, to take payments. All right, any other questions? Well, this, Andy, I can just um, mention for our, our CSA, we are, um, creating a pickup plan so no one has to get out of their vehicle um, and our CSA is, is normally free choice where folks can choose what they want each week um, that's not going to happen right now so um, it is going to be sort of the standard traditional model of this is what you get this week um, but we are implementing a route uh, to drive up and, and through almost like a drive-through um, but folks will not have to get out of their vehicle um, and then we're just being very cautious of, of trying to figure out, do we set the share down? Do they have to put it in their vehicle? How close do we get? Things like that. Um, but I'm also wondering just from, in thinking about all this, um, if Rusty, if you could talk maybe a little bit about just sort of due diligence in terms of labor and, and safety, um, and you know, just trying to think of if I'm, you know, how to get things done, but also knowing where folks are within the process from harvest to, to sale, and, and what I should be as a, a as a farm manager knowing uh, to keep my my workers safe. So OSHA, is, is one of our resources that we've got on our page right now, OSHA has put out a guidance document that's pretty good. It's non-binding. It's just mainly it's more of like a helpful hints on things to do. They're not gonna you know go out and write tickets to people for violating it. But it's a pretty good resource on how to look at some of those things. It's more general in nature. It's not going to be farm specific, but it's, it's, it is a pretty good resource and it's pretty easy to make some of those, uh, you know, changes over to a, a farm setting. Thanks. I was on a listening session yesterday um, with Arkansas Cooperative Extension and it was focused on um, kind of plans and guidance for both UPIC and farmers markets. So here in Arkansas, strawberry season is like upon us um really happening very soon and then um all the other berries um, follow quickly after and so there's lots of concern for folks who typically you know all of their berries or, or most of their berries are picked via you pick and so 
there was some good guidance given as as to how to keep that safe. And one of the one of the ideas that I thought was great, instead of, you know, typically a UPIC patch opens and, you know, hundreds or you know thousands of people show up on a Saturday to pick is scheduling times. So to limit the the number of you know families or people who come. Um, so setting up a simple like Google form to create time slots for people to show up and and pick. And one of the things they talked about, I don't think they've posted the recording of this call yet, um, so I can't post the link right now, but they called it, you know, mapping, mapping the flow. And so thinking about where people, you know, where people enter, where, you know, what they touch, how they come through on a typical, um, you know, picking situation and kind of figuring out where where people normally would congregate or touch things and to mitigate those um, those areas of the farm you know if you typically have a play place open keep that shut so um, at least the guidance in Arkansas is you know you picks and farmers markets can be open um, but with some changes to how things are managed keeping social distance trying to avoid you know as much contact as possible so um, there's some good good resources available, and if anyone would like additional information about those UPIC or farmers market strategies, please, and I will get those resources to you. One thing I would caution people on is be sure to look at your state uh, laws. So, like currently right now, Arkansas does not have a shelter in place order, or at least a mandatory one in place. Other states do. So yes. what we can do in Arkansas may not be the same as what you could do in Virginia or California or Oregon or New York. So you have to be really careful to see what laws are applicable to you where you're at. Yes, thank you, Rusty. Um, you're absolutely right. And um, check with your State Department of Agriculture or State Department of Health along those same lines. Many of them have released guidelines for you know farmers market in arkansas i know they they're allowing farmers markets to remain open but only food or essential products can be sold in the physical you know if you go to the actual farmers market they can't sell crafts or you know art or things like that and even flowers they're not allowing you know i just an open farmers market now if you place an online order and go pick it up then that's allowed so Definitely check with your state Department of Ag. Most of them have released some guidelines as to what's allowed under these circumstances. Devana posted a YouTube video, a link to a YouTube video that shows a um, CSA or online order pickup at a farm near her. So it's much like what Andy was talking about, figuring out what's a no contact or very minimal contact way for people to pick up. So you can check that video out. So here's a question from Misty. I've noticed a great deal of ag-related grants, seeking programs to flow funding towards soil, ag, ag education, food security, and farm capital it is worth looking to as an agency and organizations. So yes, there are a great number of grants available through grants.gov. As all of our NCAT staff, we will uh, say we work a lot with grants.gov and the you know federal grants and they're not easy they are a lot of work <laughs> they're very tedious um, but they can they can pay off so and definitely if you're an organization check out some of the the grants available through grants.gov if any of you have specific questions if you are a producer looking for grants I, I can follow up with you and, and give you some guidance and some of the programs many most of the USDA grant programs are are not directly for producers most of those are for organizations and agencies and universities and um, there are a few that are specifically available for producers and then there are obviously lots of loans, low interest loans and cost share programs available through USDA agencies like FSA and NRCS. I'm curious, I know right now is planting time for lots of vegetable growers. Has anyone changed their plan as far as they see opportunities and are upping their production or maybe your 
restaurant, grocery, or, you know, restaurant and farm to school sales have um, gone away and you are scaling back. Hey, Marco, it's Kara. Hey, Kara. Hi. Um, this week, uh, we, I was, I've been working with a grass fed beef producer named Bill Pryor, and um, he mostly sells to schools and uh, he lost a huge portion of his market uh, when a lot of the schools shut down because a lot of them are in smaller communities and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So he was not able to um, move that, but uh, another rancher that we work with here just started an online CSA and I uh, put them in touch. I don't know whether they'll be able to work together, but just trying to find other markets for him has been something that, that we've been working on here. So just to put that information out there, if, if you are a meat producer and you have lost a market, um, maybe contacting people who already have a CSA and seeing if they're for more product is a good way to go. If you're nervous about getting up and trying to create an online platform, some people already have a place and could, could use it because a lot of people are selling out. Yeah, thank you for that, Kara. That is a really good suggestion. And I have seen that as well, um, whether it be um, meat sellers who already had an online platform and are adding produce to that and vice versa, folks who, who maybe had a, a CSA or online produce sales and are adding um, local meat producers products to allow people to order because you're right that the process of setting up those online platforms can be tedious and maybe outside of someone's capacity. And so if you're able to work with another um, farmer to do that, that would be a great, a great option. And I hope that farmer is successful in getting his meat sold. Um, we, Andy and I heard from another farmer that we know in West Virginia, a farmer veteran who sold great all of his produce that he grew um, into the farm to school in their county and that, you know, just dried up overnight um, because even though schools are still feeding children, it's, it's mostly really, you know, processed and easy to go things and not cook a meal. Uh, at least, you know, at least what I'm seeing what my girls are <laughs> uh, bringing home from our best delivers meals, um, school meals to our, our kids here in Arkansas. So, that's that is definitely a challenge and something we, we would love to help brainstorm folks if if your markets have dried up um also just one other comment um i did put a shopping cart on my personal website for my culinary business this week and i tried both paypal uh, and square and paypal is really complicated it, it's it, you have to jump through a lot of hoops so i highly recommend square over over PayPal and Venmo is great too. I use both of those, um, but if you need an online platform, Square was super simple to set up. It was fast and um, it seems to be working really well. So I kind of would suggest maybe not going the PayPal route unless you already have something set up with them. Thanks for sharing your experience, Kara. Hi, my name is Graham with the Native American Agriculture Fund and I'm calling in on the phone. So I didn't have a way to type in the question, but May I ask a question? Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. Um, so one of the things is, so I'm not a farmer personally, but I'm, my organization represents native farmers. And so one thing I've been interested in is um, since the markets are shifting, it seems quite a bit with the lack of processing for livestock and even processing for um, crops. Have y'all noticed the trend already or what trends do you predict for how people might change um, what they're growing, uh, how much they're growing and stuff like that in response to uh, COVID? Great question. Well, I, um, I'll say a few things and then Andy or any other, anyone else wants to any of our NCAT specialists, please do. As, as Mardine, who um, shared earlier, I don't know if you were on then, um, she is a livestock producer in Indiana. And I've seen it all across the board. There's been just an extreme demand for meat and eggs 
products. And so I, I've seen livestock producers trying to scale up. I think um, even myself personally, I, I raise some meat for direct sales to customers and I've had people you know, um, email and text me like, Hey, don't you raise beef? Even though we, you know, we just do a few animals a year. So I think people are, you know, finally, uh, are becoming more aware of, you know, the, the food supply chain and that if they get it locally, it's, it's available to them. And, um, and so livestock producers I've seen have been increasing production, you know, deciding to uh, maybe finish more animals. The processing is a huge barrier, always has been and probably will continue to be so for um, livestock producers, small scale, you know, local regional livestock producers. And that's always been a bottleneck. So, and that's not an easy or cheap or fast thing to get a solution to. There's not too many people who are just jumping at the chance to open a, a livestock processing facility. And um, we know it's, it's, uh, really hard and not not always that economical. So, on the livestock side of things, that's definitely a barrier. But but definitely, I'm seeing increased interest. Same for increased interest in, in local produce. But as we've talked about a little bit, it kind of depends on how producers were selling um, their product and what markets they have access to. If you relied heavily on restaurant sales or schools, that's dried up. So some of those producers I've seen have scaled back their planting, um, where those who had CSAs or you know direct sales, they are you know able to to add more. So I don't know, Andy, if you want to add on to that. Sure, um, I could just say um, from the sort of the the crop side. Um, well, actually, even let me back up. Uh, one of the things we're seeing in in my town. Um, is that the local restaurants are actually doing very well right now with curbside pickup and, and to-go orders. Um, mm -hmm. So that has increased our sales, um, but just at that local level of restaurants. Um, as we, we, we have increased our sales, um, and Next Farm Over from us is actually scaling back as a direct result of, of labor and just knowing their, their kids are home right now and they just don't have the time to, to take on more, more production. Um, so one of the things we are seeing, though, within an increase uh, for us is that seed companies are uh, a little bit slower in getting out orders. Uh, some of them right now are only working with commercial growers and basically have set dates for saying, okay, we'll open it up to homesteaders and backyard gardeners. Uh, but right now we just need to, to focus on the commercial scale. Um, but also, you know, for, for those that do get the orders out, it's just being patient and knowing that it is taking a little bit more time to get the orders out um, because there is such a demand for, for seed right now. I think, you know, looking forward and projection, definitely I'm seeing this as a good um, good way to talk about our local food systems and, you know, the demand and the importance of our local food systems when people went to their grocery stores and the shelves were bare and they couldn't find eggs and they couldn't find meat. Um, it made them start looking towards their local producers. And so I hope that's something that sticks around even once um you know the grocery stores fill back up and uh you know we're not we're not restricted in places we can go to shop and things like that i, I really hope folks will continue to look towards their local producers and see see the importance and and how the the local producers are able to you know meet those demands and provide food when some of our traditional food chains food systems had had kind of broken down Margo, I would add too just the importance of shopping around um, as we talked at the beginning of this call about how there's just a, a huge difference in prices right now for the same product. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I was just looking for a, a sanitizer, produce sanitizer yesterday and saw uh, just within five companies a difference of $100, $125 for the same product. Um, so I definitely would just encourage everyone to, to shop around for your supplies. Yeah, thanks. And that just makes me think, Andy, um, I know in Arkansas, because I hear it on the, the news almost every day, that price gouging laws are in effect. And so um, if you if you feel like there's a company who is, is price gouging because something is, you know, in demand or um, limited supply, um, definitely check with your 
state attorney general and <laughs> turn them in. Um, we know things are in demand and harder to get, but we don't want people being taken advantage of. So that's always a good, always good advice to check around. And, you know, Devana asked the question earlier about feed and Martin shared that their feed prices had gone up and then someone in the comments had posted that their feed prices were falling in their area. I have to go back and see um, who that was or where they were at. But we know that this the situation it looks different everywhere. We we realize that, um, and so something that might be a challenge to to you might not be a challenge to someone else. So um, that's why we're kind of here sharing resources and ideas. So please let us know if you know if you have something that comes up that is a concern or a question for you. Rusty or Andy or any other NCAT specialists have anything else you would like to? share i would just say i appreciate the question on the trends you know prior to a few weeks ago when this all, all really started it was a whole different conversation particularly within direct markets uh and how the uh, the face of some of these farmers market csas and farm stands are changing so it'd be interesting you know as things settle down and, and we get through this together um i think this is just such a valuable time to really express uh, the importance of supporting local farms and, and the value of, of, of food, real food. Um, so hopefully this trend continues. Thanks, Andy. Um, I was gonna go ahead. We have just a few more minutes here. So please type in or speak up if you have questions or thoughts or something you want to share. That's um, really why we, we held this session. Um, we just wanted to give you guys a chance, a place to share hear from each other, um, you know, we, we wanna be a resource for you guys and um, help connect you to information and resources and, and help you with any of your questions. But we know it's always really good to hear from each other and uh, learn from each other. So please feel free to share or ask a question. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put back up this screen that has our contact information and our website so that if you didn't capture that earlier, you can um, check those websites out. And um, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with our ATRA website, please do check that out. We have hundreds of publications and videos, webinars, podcasts, uh, tutorials, all sorts of wonderful information. And then we have technical specialists who are available to help answer questions and connect you with resources. We have offices all across the country. So we we are, wherever you're at, we have someone probably fairly close or um, at least connected to, um, to folks in your area. So please reach out um, with any question that you may have. We are we're here to help you and assist you. Um, Hi. Uh, can I make an announcement real quick? Yes. Uh, so my name is Carly Moore, and I'm with the Native American Agriculture Fund. Thank you for letting us join this call. Uh, we just want to say that our 2020 request for applications is open. Uh, we know this is a trying time, but we thought it would be important to open it now so that we can get money to communities that need it. Uh, so again, that's the Native American Agriculture Fund. We open on April 1st, our 2020 request for applications, and it's due June 1st. You can find all the information about it on our website at nativeamericanagriculturefund.org. Again, my name is Carly, and thank you for letting us uh, make that announcement. Thank you so much, Carly, and I believe you're calling in. Um, Robin or another NCAT person, if you could plop that link into um, the chat box real fast, if you could find that, the Native American Agriculture Fund, that would be really helpful. And that does remind me, so um, NCAT's Arm to Farm program, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, is our week-long training program for military veterans. And due to this COVID situation, we've had several trainings um, that we've already had to postpone. However, um, we have a training scheduled for June, the week of June 15th in Arkansas. And at, at this point, we are proceeding with accepting applications. We, of course, are monitoring the, the COVID situation and, of course, we'll postpone if, um, 
if that's the guidance still at that time with, with group gatherings and travel restrictions and things like that. But in case things kind of get back to opening up and folks being able to move a little bit um, by mid-June, we are proceeding with the applications for that. Um, but that link will be live um, this week for sure, and we'll be promoting that and accepting applications. So if you have questions on that, please feel free to reach out to myself, and we will also be posting that on the NCAT Arm to Farm page and the Facebook page as well. So be on the lookout. All right, any other parting thoughts? I just want to say thank you all so much for joining us. Um, it was really great to see if some of you and hear from some of you. And um, we please be in contact if we can help in any way or you think of some other question that we didn't get a chance to answer here. Um, please reach out to our NCAT staff or Rusty's happy to help answer questions as well. So. Um, I hope you all stay well and um, and take care in this time. Thanks, Thank everyone. Appreciate Thank it. You guys. Thank you.